Let's talk about Hire at Radio. You mm. land in this job uh, at Radio Caroline, yeah. and you're on a boat called the Mi Amigo, Mi Amigo moored yeah. off the coast of, of Essex. A weird thing to go and live on a, on a ship. Um, I read the advert and I got the job, and I, uh, I remember going out from Harwich, because what we were doing, it was in territorial waters. It flew under the flag of Panama, and uh, we, the, we, we went through customs, and the idea was we were going to Holland. But for three years, we never got there. We stopped off on the way and played music. And uh, I remember seeing this little ship bobbing around in the ocean. I thought, God, this is wonderful. And um, I thought, this ship is giving the government so many problems. Mm. And, uh, and it was. It was kind of it anarchic was, yes. and it was, it was. dangerous yeah. and exciting. Yeah. Everyone loved it, didn't they? It was the most wonderful experience of my life. It was uh, just tremendous. And I knew right from the word go that this was going to alter the whole of broadcasting. Now, is it true that, that when you were on this ship, that you actually saved Kenny Everett's life? Uh, when I was on Big L Radio London, yes. I came up to do the breakfast show and we had... It, it, was, it was like a gangway where the tender boat would go and we would cross from one boat to the other. And Kenny was there in a slight dazed look. And he was, he was obviously on something. And he, he was just about to step over. So he taken drugs? Yeah, I guess he had, yeah. yeah. And... Um, he was just about to go, and I quickly went up to him, took him by the arm, and I said, what are you doing, Kenny? He said, I'm going to walk to Frinton. I said, no, no, you're not. And I, I took him to one side, and, and I put him in his cabin and told somebody he was in there. So and if you he, hadn't done that... He'd have, he'd have died, yeah, because, um, because the currents out in the North Sea, you know, had just been swept away. You also had a career as a pop star. Yeah. According to your friend, uh, the DJ Mike Reed, in the early days you were known as Bournemouth's answer to Cliff Richard. <laughs> We actually have an audio clip of really? you in your heyday doing yeah. this, yeah. I got so much love I want to give you. Baby, I've got so much love I want to give you. Uh, that record, actually, So Much Love, we bought that out at the same time as opening up Radio 1, and unfortunately, it went in about number 32, I think, or something like that, and then the pressing plant went on strike. And uh, I don't know if it's to do with the record, but... Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it would have gone to number one, not because the record was mm. great, but, but it, there was so much publicity at the time. Did you feel like this terrible, thwarted sense of what might have been? No, no, no. I mean, I wasn't the greatest singer in the world, but I, I, I didn't give up. I made another 28 records. <laughs> you had, you had, had of them became hits. <laughs> in fact, I remember going down to, down to the pressing plant in, um, at EMI, when the Beatles had a record out and they were churning them out on this automatic machine. And I had a new record out and there was a dear old lady in the corner doing mine by, by hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was it. But, uh, you know, I kept going at it, yes. For four years, you weren't just a DJ, but also a kind of sex therapist on your weekday morning <laughs> show for Radio London. Yeah. Um, instead of the weather, you would do a something test. Do you remember what that was? Um, oh, that was a nipple test, yeah. And how did that work? Well, because, uh, if it was chilly, then uh, my nipples would go hard. So, um, so we'd take the heating down in the warm, studio. And if it was what would happen? We, uh, we, well, it'd be soft. <laughs> <laughs> How's the temperature in here at the moment? Um, a bit chilly. <laughs> <laughs> you also proposed a national banging day. You proposed that everybody should sleep with somebody yeah. of a different nationality. You saw it as your way to stamp out racism. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do remember that, yeah. And I... Yeah, it was... Well... <laughs> I've, always, uh, I've always hated any full racism, and I, I think if we did have that happen, mm. everybody slept with somebody of a different nationality, yeah. you, you, you couldn't discriminate against anybody. It's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. I thought I could solve the whole world's problem in, with that, in that one day. <laughs> Tony, let's find out how you went from being king of the jingle to king of the jungle. In 1984, Tony, now aged 41, was dropped by Radio 1 after 17 years at the station. That is the sound there of Spandau Ballet. And that's it. Well, this is the sort of end of an era, really. I don't think he took it particularly well that he wasn't the nation's top DJ anymore. He was enjoying doing what he was doing and he was very sad to, to give it up. I think being in the limelight is really important to, to, to my dad. Tony moved into local radio. The fashions were changing as the old guard of nice guy DJs became ripe for satire. 
taste mongers. I'm just having a nice cup of tea here. I love tea, don't you? Smashy and Nicey caused problems for some radio presenters because it made it sound like that era was gone. Makes you think, doesn't it? Tony got caught up in that, without a doubt. From a career point of view, it probably knocked him back a few years. And on TV in the 80s and 90s, Tony was no longer the star, but the sidekick. When Tony was in Noel's house party, he was something of a comedy victim character. He normally sort of turned up and then had the door slammed in his face. Tony also launched a reinvention as a raunchy nightclub DJ. He would play the records and dance around, show his hairy chest, take half his clothes off, and do all sorts of things with balloons. In his heart of hearts, I think he would have hated that time. He was a bit lost. He was sort of in the wilderness. Tony Blackburn is good at what he does, and he deserves a huge audience. He knows that. In 2002, when Tony was 59, he signed up for the cast of a brand new celebrity reality show set in the Australian jungle. My thoughts were, oh my God, what are you doing? It was the first program, and none of us had a full idea of exactly what was going to be in store for us. I think he found the first week quite tough. I don't know how anybody survives in this place. You know, I mean, there are snakes just ready to leap out at you. Oh, it's a nightmare. But Tony found an unlikely source of comfort. Tony, of course, became completely and utterly obsessed by logs. Do you mind if I go and get another couple of logs? Nobody's doing anything, am I? He's driving me absolutely mad. Hello, logs. How are you? Lovely to Hello. see you. See, that's what I call my daytime log. But it clearly endeared him to all the viewers. He had his naturalness and warmth that the audience warmed to. <laughs> log log man. man! And so he got the boots. Tony reached the final, and 12 million viewers tuned in. The public have been voting. The phone lines are now closed. Uh, I was desperately urging him on to win. The last celebrity to get out of here, the king of the jungle, is Tony. Oh, oh. well done. Oh, <laughs> Good oh for you. so delighted. I just couldn't believe he'd won. Nearly 20 years after leaving Radio 1, Tony was basking in the limelight once again. He was completely delighted, not only because he won, but also because of the way it meant that people viewed him and people perceived him. Thank you very much to all the public that voted for me. You know, I, I didn't think you liked me. <laughs> Tony Blackburn went into the jungle as someone remembered for slightly naff jokes, and he came out of the jungle as someone who the nation had really taken to their hearts. It was like a second coming. You said about it that before that show, I felt I was more of a British irritant than a national mm. treasure. How did the, the moment you knew you'd won, how did it make you feel? Well, I thought it was just tremendous. You know, I didn't think for one moment. I mean, I loved, I loved doing the programme. I thought it was terrific. And I did love the logs. And I recognised one or two of them as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, it was, it was terribly flattering. You know, I, I had no idea I'd win it. And uh, to win something like that is tremendous. I really wanted to do it because I thought it was the first one, so we didn't know what it was all about. And I'm a vegetarian and I wouldn't kill anything or anything like that. And um, they said to me, he said, well, are you, do you like outdoor life? I said, not particularly. And they said, uh, well, what would you eat there if you're a vegetarian in the jungle? I said, well, presumably, we do the filming during the day and go back to a hotel in the <laughs> evening. Because uh, <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. And they said, oh, no, no, you've got to survive out there. And it's a really tough programme to do. Did you think you could also change uh, an increasing public perception, perhaps from all the smashy and nicey thing, yeah. that you were by then a bit of a joke, that you could actually mm. realign that? Honestly, I promise you, Piers, I never thought of it like that at all. And I never thought of myself as being a joke either. Mm. But, I, uh, but I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. And sometimes when I, when I left Radio 1, uh, when I was, uh, you know, the contract wasn't renewed after 17 years, um, I didn't realise how far down I'd gone. But I didn't go out there in the jungle to uh, re-establish myself. That wasn't the, wasn't the point. It was just, it was a television programme that I th found quite fascinating. The fact that I won it obviously was a plus. Well, there was a moment afterwards when you got back to, to England yes. and you were stopped by an elderly man at a yes. petrol station 
who congratulated you, but it was what he said moved you very much, didn't well, it? Well, it did, yes. This dear old bloke, it must have been about 82 or something, came to me with, on, on the sticks and he put his arm around me and said, you've done so much for our age group. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so... It was so warm the way he did it, you know. So I thought, well, I'm probably not quite as old as you, but it doesn't matter, you know, the fact that uh, he, he was so warm and he was so lovely. I've never forgotten it. When it all blew up and became yeah. this huge thing with Parliament debating it and so on, <laughs> what were you thinking? Well, I thought it's gone a bit further than I thought it would.